I think that means I'm on. Uh, my name is Bill Flora. I'm an interaction designer. I have been uh, an interaction designer uh, in town for 20 years or so. So I've seen a big arc uh, in this, uh, this industry. And um, it's been super exciting. As you can imagine, it's super exciting now. There's so much to, to talk about. And so thanks, thanks for coming. I, I thought I would really just focus on those things that uh, I thought were really effective and things that uh, inspired me as, uh, as a designer, some, some lessons that I've learned over the years. And I guess uh, the subject of the talk um, uh, is really what I would consider the, the, the main principles that that drive me, or, or the reason that I do this. And uh, uh, so I focus on software design, and um, I think, of course, it's got to be beautiful, it's got to be functional, it has to help you get your job done pretty quickly and easily, but I really uh, think we uh, need to do more now than what we're doing with software. And for me, the broader goals are just engaging people, um, uh, inspiring people, um, getting them delighted. It's, it's at that level, I think, that we uh, as designers really want to pull people in. It, it helps us do, uh, do the job. So um, over the next 30, 40 minutes or so, uh, and then we can open up for questions, uh, I'd love to just go through um, uh, some of the things which I think uh, try and, and hit those goals uh, with, with software design. Um, so uh, also related to that, I guess, is when, when you establish some principles as a, a designer or a business with your user experience, uh, how powerful that, that can be. And so these two are related, and um, that's... Um, that's kind of where it starts. And when I think about um, what I believe in or like my most important principles as I approach these types of things, um, I, I really think about it from the perspective of a brand, whatever client I'm working with, trying to deeply understand what they're about, what they believe, what's the soul of what they do, because I believe software design is the, the place where you can bring that to life more than marketing communications, more than other places. It's in the, it's in the software uh, <clears throat> where you can really get at those types of things because people touch it, they live it, that is the, the brand. So that's one of my points of view or perspective is uh, the experience itself is the best man manifestation of the brand, uh, from what features you develop to, to how it's presented. Um, another thing I've found for me is uh, the importance of the intersection between interaction design, visual design, and motion. Um, uh, I really like to think of those things as, as one, uh, n not three different things. Um, uh, don't really like working on the interaction design and the interaction architecture and then throwing that over to the visual designer and the good luck. And those things really need to be thought of together. And I think you'll see in a lot of this presentation uh, how motion is even a, a more uh, critical factor uh, for that. And uh, we love motion and um, uh, we all don't get the um, opportunity to integrate motion into our user experience. Um, uh, we're, we're getting there, definitely, on uh, some of the new technologies and uh, tablets and mobile phone. Um, I've had the opportunity to be working in the realm of motion for, for many years and helping to craft that, so I'll show some of that. Um, and at the end of the day, as a designer, really attention to detail, lots of craftsmanship, um, you'd be surprised at those little things that really get people engaged. Uh, they, go, they can go a long way. Um, so those little details, um, I think, are huge. So uh, basically, the talk is about these things. Um, and 
Uh, I'll show a quick uh, reel. Okay, that's just a little bit. That's um, <clears throat> maybe uh, uh, 20 seconds of um, uh, motion and visual and interaction. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit, uh, I'll be showing you more in details into that and some thinking behind that kind of stuff. But uh, that's the emotion that I'm trying to get at with software design. Definitely in the consumer space, um, I think that's, um, uh, that's a key component. Um, I think I think that comes from uh, a long time ago, designing for the, the living room and designing software where you needed to use a remote control. And you're right there with broadcast network motion graphics. So you're competing with uh, really high-end um, motion capabilities and being able to build software where you can also help define the platform, uh, baking in some of those key uh, motion capabilities was, was really huge. Um, I'm going to shift now a little bit to <clears throat> some of the, the principles that really helped uh, drive and define one, well, kind of my philosophy, but a lot of the Microsoft uh, visual direction as well. Um, here's some examples of principles that I love. Some come from you know, just basic principles around balance and proportion, just good design, um, um, <clears throat> using as little design as possible. I like that. Or the concept of uh, trying to approach something with elegance, which is my definition, doing a lot with a little, um, getting out of the way. Uh, one of these principles, I think, informed um, uh, the Microsoft new look and feel more than any other, and that is, it's about the content. Uh, it's not about uh, the chrome and the shiny floor and the glassy buttons. It's about being really attentive to the content and treating it really, really well. So um, I'll show you some examples of that. Of course, this is not Microsoft, but uh, <clears throat> a lot of you are probably familiar with some of the changes in iOS 7, and this is really kind of getting at uh, what I mean. We don't have to have uh, buttons that look like hardware buttons anymore. Like, thank goodness. Um, <clears throat> and now uh, Apple's embraced that too. Uh, I'm going to take you uh, into the Wayback Machine. When I first um, started at Microsoft, um, this was the second project that I got to work on. Uh, the first project was doing some toolbar buttons for Office. And um, I did the uh, indent button in Office, the toolbar button. Anyone ever use indent? Anyway, I'll, I'll, <clears throat> I'll take credit for that one. Uh, I still use that. And uh, the second was uh, uh, Encarta Encyclopedia. And uh, my background as a graphic designer, newly coming to interaction, uh, really uh, in a naive way, looked at this not as software, but more as um, what it could be. Um, and my sensitivities were much more around print design. So the first thing I wanted to do in Photoshop is start filling in all those buttons and uh, filling in all the borders, get things out of boxes, open it up a little bit. And uh, the next generation of Encarta um, basically is uh, a little cleaner, a little more open. Uh, it doesn't feel as computery, uh, if you will. And it's kind of that approach that I just kept trying to fight that fight at Microsoft. And um, uh, Encarta was a great first example um, of the ability of being able to do that. Um, yeah, this was in 95, I think. And then, of course, screen resolutions get uh, a little bit bigger. 
And, you know, the philosophy of, hey, what can we do more with the content? And, well, let's bring the content up to the surface. And so the next generation uh, was just, well, a little larger, more screen resolution. And I can start to, rather than start an article right at the beginning, I can uh, bubble up key contents with, with tiles and other ways to get into, uh, uh, to get into the content. Um, so let me jump over to Xbox a little bit and I'll again illustrate this example of it's, it's about content, not about Chrome. Uh, does anybody remember this? Uh, these were, I think the code name was Blades. They were Blades. And um, so this is a little design exercise that we did to um, <clears throat> try and take this to the next generation. So. Uh, really, let's see if we can make this feel more content-oriented. Um, maybe we don't need all that extra stuff, and instead of text, let's show some of the show some of the content. We've got more bandwidth now. We we have the ability to start to do this. It seems like a lot of us were really trapped in what a computer look and feel should be like, and. Um, this is trying to break it out of there. So in just a couple steps, I've removed these uh, links and turned them into something that's a little more inviting, and it's more informative. It tells you even a little bit more uh, about what. And then, well, maybe add a little visual kung fu in the background. And um, so we've moved a long way away from the first um, <clears throat> slide um, uh, in I think something that just feels a little more content oriented, but now you've still got these big blades on, on the side. Do you really, do you, do you need all of that? What if you just showed what that would be? Just really show it. Um, I don't really need to know what it is. Um, I just know that I need, I can get over there. Uh, this uh, example was never used at Xbox, but I think it's a great example of how that principle when applied can really lead to um, a, a new way to think. So um, <clears throat> I think same content, um, just different philosophy, different principle. Um, so um, why do principles work? Well, um, here's a slide I'm actually probably just going to read uh, down, but um, I think Principles help you articulate as a designer. It helps you come together as an organization. Um, uh, I, I think really doing the hard work and being able to articulate what you believe in, what your values are, those can come uh, uh, across as uh, and be uh, uh, established as principles. Um, in addition, they really help to guide other designers, other people in, in the organization when you're having a conversation about a particular direction or a certain design, uh, going back to the principle again, if we all agree on some of these goals and principles up front, then we can start to analyze the, uh, the solution from, from that perspective. So it, it's very, they're very, very persuasive. Um, they also help you make decisions and, and priorities. Um, I think a lot of the uh, work that we did at Microsoft over the years were using some of these principles, but they were never articulated. It wasn't until Windows Phone where we had to say, well, what, what is the philosophy? What is our approach? And really starting to codify those with real terms is what helped that direction take hold across the company. So, um, uh, and to that end, I think if there's several different efforts trying to arrive at the same conclusion, uh, having principles guide you is uh, a very um, powerful goal. So separate efforts tend to arrive at the same um, uh, and similar outcome. Um, the, the principles that we uh, arrived at for the Metro language, which became the modern language, which became the Microsoft language, uh, uh, really is about being more clean and open, uh, clear hierarchy 
in terms of how you um, delineate information. Again, it's about content. Um, I would say you can't overemphasize the importance of typography. That was, a, uh, and I still uh, believe this today. If you think about content being the most important thing, um, typography is one of the the most powerful ways to um, express that, because so much of our content that we're dealing with is typographic in nature. Uh, motion, of course, um, just the fact that we're designing for a new medium and not getting stuck in some of the old, and, and I think we're mostly out of that now, especially with Apple switching gears and a lot of great work in, in uh, websites, et cetera, but designing for our, our medium. Um, and that attention to detail is really important. Everything, everything matters. So um, this is, um, well, on the right, iTunes. That's kind of the way where iTunes was just um, a year ago or so. So it's been a long evolution from Encarta and the skew morphism, and uh, that's Windows Mobile uh, in blue. This was, this was how computers were, um, it was really the limitations of the technology, I think the limitations of the um, uh, designer's imaginations, and, and some of these principles applied and the ability to have uh, more colors, greater resolution, um, I think really enabled us to arrive at uh, something completely different. Um, of course, um, I think we're taking a lot of cues from just good graphic design. Graphic design has been around for many, many years, and uh, now that we have big expanded uh, resolutions in, in our monitors and larger screens, it starts to become more like print, and you can start to apply some more print-like uh, principles. And uh, here's a, an example of um, some inspiration in terms of uh, wayfinding systems and uh, signage. Uh, I think uh, I was inspired by the Seattle airport, just how um, strong and grounded some of these graphics were. They, they work across a variety of different airport architectures. I mean, it's, uh, it helps people get places. I think that was very inspirational. And of course, just good Swiss uh, graphic design. Um, great typography, sense of proportion and scale. Um, so um, <clears throat> I'll show you how that was applied then to the, the next generation of uh, Xbox, where um, <clears throat> I don't, maybe some of you remember this. It's not that long ago. And um, how I looked at this is kind of an imaginary 3D, feels a little wonky, it's a little fuzzy and rounded corners. Those rounded corners took years to get. We would, would tell developers, oh, we really need to have rounded corners. And they said, well, we can't do rounded corners. Uh, it's just not how code works. And uh, finally, finally, uh, we could get some corners that were rounded. And wow, and then once they said, we've got, we can do rounded corners now. And um, uh, we don't really want rounded corners anymore. <laughs> Sorry, it's not about rounded corners. Uh, um, so uh, uh, this is just an example of uh, something a little crisper, a little tighter, a little more open. This was more how if we apply those metro principles to this. This is something that uh, we would uh, get at. Um, the, um, uh, this is the next step from, um, <clears throat> from there. We, we were really looking at this from the perspective of a tablet uh, design um, and realized it works pretty well for the console at a distance with the remote control or with your hands. Um, we could get more content on the screen. It's really made a strong, um, <clears throat> it's been a big change. Uh, for Xbox, so this is um, similar <clears throat> to where um, where Xbox is going. And then 
how do we apply that across the system? I think alignment across all the screens. It feels like one brand. It com comes from one place across all of this. Can you create a responsive UI or some types of the principles or guidelines that really help it interact the same and, and have the look and feel be, be the same. That was a big goal and very difficult to do in a large organization like, um, like Xbox. I think Windows Mobile was the, the most striking example where um, here we um, <clears throat> were at a crossroads. Uh, iPhone had just come out, this looks 10 years older, like, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? Um, we had just released Zune HD, Zune, really fun product, uh, a little too little, a little too late in the marketplace, but really formative in terms of influencing things um, at Microsoft. It was getting good traction. Uh, Gizmodo really uh, liked the design direction, like, okay, we got something good here. How do we take the Zune uh, what we like about Zune and start applying it to uh, Windows Mobile. And it was really that question that m made us develop the principles. What is it that really works? Things that can translate and that we can communicate to other people. Um, and that, that resulted in this, this prototype uh, for Windows Phone, which really is about graphic design. It's, it's about good proportion and, and white space uh, scale relationships with typography and just, just kind of opening up a little bit. You don't have to cram in every region and, and section. Um, and here you can see some of the circles that were inspired at the Seattle airport uh, for icons. Um, so this really um, <clears throat> was something that we thought, well, Zune HD doesn't apply to everyone. Um, uh, what's something that could work in a broader form in, uh, for the phone? So these were some uh, early examples and um, uh, what resulted in on the right, which is uh, the Windows phone direction. Again, really typographic. Um, uh, this, the, the Windows phone team, uh, created and Jeff Fong and uh, they just did a, I think a fabulous job of uh, executing on on this and that really helped it get traction um, around the company and um, but we also worked with the Windows team um, still still back in the old uh, old school and um, <clears throat> okay how would you apply uh, how would you tackle this with Metro and this is exactly the same type of thing that we would do for Encarta Encyclopedia. Let's remove all the boxes and all the borders and just see how the type holds up by itself. Well, it doesn't. Uh, uh, so we need to change kind of the, the scale and the size and the proportion and think about the white space and really use the space itself as structure rather than relying on um, uh, all these boxes. And I think, I think those boxes were remnants of living in a 640 by 480 world uh, where we had to cram everything in and a box was a good way to delineate, but now we have the freedom uh, of real estate. Um, so that was kind of a, just a before and after of those two. Same exact content, uh, but uh, uh, emphasizing content rather than um, uh, the Chrome. Or, okay, great, how can you do a ribbon, though, in Metro? Well, same thing, take everything out of the, these, these buttons and uh, clean it up a little bit. Uh, so these are examples that um, we see now in uh, uh, Google and uh, many other places are really applying these same types of techniques. Uh, and I think the advent of <coughs> graphic design uh, and uh, more real estate had, had helped this come about. So uh, I would say big takeaways from, from this, it's uh, really taking advantage of great typography, and by typography, I don't mean what's that typeface you use, but uh, how do things lay out, uh, um, what are the proportions, and, uh, and does the typography really represent the hierarchy of the content that you wanna create? Um, 
So <clears throat> I, uh, I'll shift gears a little bit. Um, that was pretty much at a, at a high level um, of design principles. If you get a little more specific uh, and you want to find something that really fits with a particular brand, helping uh, designers and um, uh, different organizations arrive at personality and using words and principles to help arrive at the personality has been, um, well, here's an example of how words um, can really uh, impact something. So uh, here's an example. So I'm going to show you the same words but different mood boards. Um, uh, here's an example of Maybe something that we would interpret as confident and crafted, alive, we can't really talk about that. Um, that would be more with the motion that comes in, but um, uh, it wants to be all, we want it to be all of these words, but let's focus a little bit more on confident and crafted. Um, a little, uh, this one uh, is emphasizing the iconic a little bit more and, and beautiful. Um, uh, these words and these principles are great tools for helping design a line to the brand direction and the values of the organization. Because um, then we can start talking about, we have agreement up front, uh, and then we can start talking about how the different visual solutions, how well does it meet those goals. But getting those goals established up front um, for anything you do, I think, is really important. Um, same sets of words, but more emphasis. Um, so, um, not exactly 100% relevant, but uh, it's a little more uh, getting into the nuanced uh, words. So, these essentially are all kind of that metro design language in a way, and that if metro is just about good design, uh, but how you can get even more nuanced with it. So, um, <clears throat> let's see, the, the next principle I would say, uh, uh, for me at least, after content not chrome, is, um, is about motion, and how motion can really bring uh, the design to life. And uh, I'm just going to put the takeaways first after I show some motion, but I, I'd like you to look at it from, from these three uh, principles of motion. Uh, and uh, I would say we really are looking for something that is, um, uh, feels natural. Um, there's nothing in nature that's a straight curve or, you know, uh, straight, that everything has fluidity to it. We want it to feel more organic and natural. Um, I think with motion, what I've learned over the years is how to be really subtle. And you can get uh, a lot done with uh, small moves. It doesn't need to be big, and um, <clears throat> although you will see some big moves. But uh, like that subtlety, a little bit goes a long way. And um, I, s I also think um, complexity. Uh, uh, and or nuance that there's a lot of different things going on. Um, I think those are the things that get emotion. Get uh, and being able to integrate motion with kind of this graphic design oriented um, software, it takes pressure off of the look. Uh, so the look doesn't have to work so hard and get you all excited. It can be pretty direct um, uh, and put the weight more on uh, what you do with motion uh, to carry the, the emotion of the experience. So I'd much rather work in motion than glassy floors and buttons, etc. cetera. Um, but, um, so here's an example of uh, some motion. We didn't have... Uh, a lot of, we had stills that we had to work with, but we um, <clears throat> still tried to create a little atmosphere. This is um, uh, for the NFL, and we wanted to kind of bring that stadium experience into the living room. Uh, hey, it knows me, so 
It knows that I want to see you head to head um, right off the bat. Um, subtle little things. Uh, here's a countdown. So right when the game Wilson starts. Shotgun, three receivers to Wilson's right side. Four man rush. Little stunt up front. Wilson has some time, buys time, now throws back. Got a man downfield. Looking downfield, Bowman makes a catch. Inside the 35 yard line of the Patriots. A long pass. Subtle little things when I uh, and select and things move it down a little bit, then up helps. Users keep track of where things are going. Perfect deep pass inside the Patriots 35. A pickup. I think the use of motion can easily be gratuitous, but if you look at it from the perspective of how to help a user really understand where where they are, uh, where they can go, uh, it 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 helps you. It, it relieves you of having to do some other things. Um, this is just uh, simple information graphics, um, but um, subtle. Small changes. Uh, this was the Windows Phone prototype that we developed. Um, and we, we wanted motion also to make your experience feel like it's alive. It's not just static. Even when it's just sitting there, we can really do a lot to make it feel alive. Or give it dimensionality with the, with the transitions. Use that dimensionality to inform you about how things are structured. Or I think in this case, when I click on Amy Woodhouse, her name just gets larger. So it helps keep with the context. Those little things, um, they're hard to do in code. It has to be structured that way. Um, <clears throat> like the little flag waving. You'd be surprised, those little details. People love that kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> with Encarta Encyclopedia, way back in the day when you would hover your mouse over, over a menu item, it would automatically just go whoosh and fly down. Like, ah, oh, that was amazing back then. <laughs> um, so uh, motion can help also give you a sense of an expanded uh, real estate um, that you can, uh, I think there's a tendency to have every screen feel like it really, uh, everything has to be contained in that screen, but you can uh, think about the screen more as a window and uh, lets you take advantage of a, a, broader, a broader space. People's brains fill in the blanks, um, and I think motion can help you uh, uh, get at that. Um, of course, now you've got gyroscopes, accelerometers, and um, Apple's come out with a new background, but you can really start to take that um, to your advantage. This is giving you a sense of things that are near nearby. Um, this is um, another piece that's very much like a magazine, very editorial oriented thing. We could have easily just presented this on a tablet and I scroll through it, but um, a little bit of the right motion can help bring focus to, to the right thing. Um, <clears throat> Or if I want a little more information, I can always scroll up, learn a little bit more. So those are examples that, that I like with motion. Um, when you're designing for motion, those are my three main principles. Um, but I, I do think it's got uh, an even greater role to play um, uh, which relates to my, my last principle, and that's one of the first ones I went in with, which is uh, I like to think of these three things as one thing when you can, because it frees you up. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, I'll try and show some examples of where, where that's the case. Um, uh, this is 
an example where it's just content. And uh, I'm hovering over with the mouse. Um, and I can click on a picture. It comes to the middle. Its things come up. But we couldn't really do this design uh, without, without uh, the motion capability. The interaction is completely dependent upon uh, what content is there and how it's going to move. But uh, I think we're going to be seeing more of uh, things that don't necessarily look like web pages or, or print design um, uh, when you start to apply some of these principles, when more people have more capabilities to do more motion and we get more adept at it. I think uh, you'll start to see more interfaces that, that uh, and we have seen a lot of those um, that can really take it to, to a new place. Um, uh, this is what we call well, semantic zoom um, using uh, z-axis. One thing I love about this type of thing is there are no back buttons. Um, we're just using content as a way to get back. We've established that um, <clears throat> this text is something that I can click on on the top to go back to. Uh, if we can get a, rid of a lot of the affordances for interactions and extra buttons and make it a little cleaner, more pure, uh, that's something I look for. And, and I think when we do something like that, um, users seem to respond. Uh, it might take uh, a little bit more uh, to learn, but then once they're there, it, um, uh, it, it's really powerful. Um, so I think motion uh, reduces the need to, to decorate, basically, uh, because you can carry the, mo the emotion that you want to get um, through the motion itself. Uh, reduces the need for visual affordances. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm like here a cheerleader for motion. I, that's what it sounds like now. But um, I love it. I think it's great. I think that's the new, some new uncharted territory with, with software design. Um, so uh, that that kind of uh, brings me to questions um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, just to reiterate, I think these are the things that I think about in software design. Uh, and it's really, there are, there, it's all uh, tools to um, uh, the graphic design, the motion. It's all there just to get people, I think, getting their job done but inspiring them. It's, it's a higher order than just getting the job done. So that's what I uh, hope we do more of. Um, and uh, I'll take some questions and, and I'll, I'll leave some Dieter Ram's uh, principles uh, on the screen. <laughs> uh, and uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to, uh, to answer. And oh, I, um, if you wouldn't mind using the microphone because we're uh, recording. Uh, so I was really struck the first video that you showed. It was on beat and um, like with the sound. And it was like close enough that I noticed it that it was on. But if it had been off, it probably would have been like just subtly off. Probably would have bothered me a lot. If it had been like completely unrelated, I probably wouldn't have noticed it. Do you deal with sound a lot in design? Uh, uh, that, that forms, um, for that piece, that formed the, the foundation. We start with the audio track. And that's kind of the inspiration. Um, we know what kind of pieces we want to put together, but absolutely, like when the tablet goes like this and right to that beat, that's a, a really powerful thing you can do. So we, we start with the music. Now you were uh, talking about uh, design, motion, and interaction all being uh, one stroke. Now, is that one stroke from like a rugged individualist designer, or is it still more a collaborative process? Oh, it's absolutely collaborative. Uh, I don't know how to do it otherwise. There's just so many things to consider with so much of our software design these days. It's you know, it's like a film director. It needs to pull so many different disciplines together. It helps when there's a clear vision. Uh, and someone that knows how to drive that vision across uh, a, a variety of uh, different skills. But um, no, it's, I don't think it's just one, one designer at all. So at Microsoft, 
Back before there was a Metro UI or design principles, how did you convince those people at the table to leave what was considered to be standards, norms within design and move forward? Yeah, I, I have a variety of techniques <laughs> that I've had to use. That was a big part of my job is uh, fighting that, that good fight. Um, and well, one technique would be finding disciplines that really like developers that really got it and uh, working closely with them or aligning myself with executives that really got it. And um, uh, with Windows Media Center and Zune, we had executives that really saw, even in Card Encyclopedia, people that saw what design could do. Um, <clears throat> I would use other techniques similar to the, the, the Xbox one step at a time approach and kind of like a used car salesman, I'd get people nodding their heads in each step, uh, like, oh, this makes sense. You, well, yes, it does. And, and then I'd do one more step. That makes sense, too. And like, oh, yes. And before you know it, I had them agreeing to my point of view uh, one step at a time. Had I just shown them the end result, uh, like, whoa, that's way too much. Um, so that was a technique that I thought was pretty powerful. Uh, also, like a lot of the pieces that you saw here, um, being able to build high fidelity uh, prototypes, most that I used were with After Effects, but if you can do higher fidelity prototypes with any like real code or prototyping tools, better. Um, but being able to show uh, what it could look like at a high fidelity, really, uh, and with motion, I uh, got a lot of people excited. So I, um, I think I was one of the, uh, the people I got to work with on Media Center, we were some of the first people that would use motion. And um, uh, I think appealing to people on the emotional level. So there's that, but there's also um, needing to work at the UI platform level, like with HTML or something, there's only, there's limitations. Uh, we were fortunate enough to work in a company where they built their own UI platforms, so we could work ahead of time um, and get get the developers of the UI platforms to start to bake in some of these capabilities um, uh, and use some of our designs as a, as a north star to where we could say, don't put all your effort into making rounded corners anymore. Put your effort into motion capabilities, typographic capabilities, those types of things. So, yeah, a variety. Hey, so um, it's really awesome to see some of your work that you've done with uh, the Microsoft design language especially and how consistent the message has been even since um, the Encarta days. I see a lot that represents uh, the kind of the typography and hierarchy that you use. Uh, so it's really awesome to see that and how it's become part of that company's culture. Yeah. Um, what do you plan to do in the next stage of your career to kind of evolve whatever you want to do with Tectonic? Yeah. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better question. Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled by that legacy. My philosophy still kind of carries through everything that I do. So um, we'll still use a lot of that philosophy in, in what we do. But I think what excites me now is a little more variety. Um, <clears throat> that it doesn't just have to be represented in this one uh, style. Um, uh, I, I really like working with a variety of different types of clients, a lot of different types of problems to solve. Um, I, I'm personally really interested in what's going to be happening in uh, the living room. I think mobile is uh, great, and um, but um, maybe it was my days in Windows Media Center, but. Uh, really bringing that content to life in, in new ways is, is really how a tablet works with a big screen or how uh, an interpretive museum exhibits space. I can really engage uh, kids with some of the content that's, that's there. Um, so um, <clears throat> there's that. There's also just next generation publishing. Uh, really what we focus on uh, at Tectonic is well, uh, next generation mobile look and feel, but also um, 
uh, new content experiences, how, how to uh, make content come to life a little bit more, like the, the um, uh, NFL piece uh, I thought might be new and interesting. We've also got to work, on a, uh, speaking of variety, uh, zombies in The Walking Dead. <laughs> and um, uh, how to, that project kind of died. Um, then it came back to life again, then it died again. Like, so uh, um, we'll see where that goes. But uh, yeah, I love content. Um, uh, I think we'll do, be doing more uh, with that. Um, so when you're planning for mobile, where does it enter, I guess, the planning stage? Um, are you creating low fidelity prototypes of motion ideas you have, or like, where does that just enter the design process? Yeah, we like to bring it in uh, as early as possible. So like projects I'm working on now, we're moving things around, we're moving uh, wireframes around. We're, we're, we're moving gray squares around. Just like that one Zoom piece I showed you, that was all before we had high fidelity look and feel, that was just really tight and well-proportioned wireframes. Um, so we, um, uh, we, we do like to have uh, interaction designers, visual designers, keep that in mind and keep motion front and center as we're really problem solving. Um, so it uh, also then, of course, towards the end of the process, that's when it's really hot and heavy, but um, uh, early on. We saw a lot of effort from different companies try to simplify experience and try to embrace the simplicity as one of their pillars. But in your slide, you show complexity as one of the keywords for your design development. Could you articulate a bit more what do you mean for? Yeah, uh, complex? for complexity, that was kind of in the context of um, motion. And like, for example, when we transitioned from one screen to the next, uh, with like a like a, a mail list control or something, rather than bring all the uh, all the the headline and subhead and body copy all in at the same time, we kind of brought the headline in first and had the other ones just follow it just slowly right behind. I mean, very nuanced. People, we don't want people really to overthink it, but it's those little things which I say is a little bit more complex. It's subtle, but but complex in that there's a few different things moving on. I'm not just going X, Y, uh, or, or just X axis. I put a little bit of Y axis in there, and uh, that's kind of what I meant by that. Yeah. How do you approach design for products that have maybe a longer heritage for, uh, as distinctly from products that are, might be newer? And yeah, well, I um, we had the opportunity to work with uh, Bang & Olufsen, and they have a really long heritage in uh, consumer electronics and super high-end um, uh, industrial design. And uh, we had to be very sensitive to who Bang & Olufsen is and uh, what their um, what their values were, and uh, like that example I showed you, we really dug into you know what are the words that describe Bang and Olson in terms that can you can extrapolate across industrial design, software design. So we we start with um, with the client in agreement on these are the principles of uh, what you're all about. So the work that we do is really guided. Um, it makes it more efficient, too. It's very much guided by, by those principles. So uh, we felt really successful when their creative director said, oh, now that's Bang & Olufsen. Like, oh, yeah, we got it. Um, so um, it's not always about um, creating something new for news sake. Uh, it's, it's more deeply understanding the philosophy and maybe interpreting it in a more modern way to where it still uh, resonates. Um, yes. 
I feel like I'm back at design school hearing all about design philosophy and sort of <laughs> designing something because you have a principle in mind. Nowadays, all I hear about is, you know, it's about the users and you got to test. And so how does all of that factor into what you're doing while you're principles and users and... Yeah, uh, I, I, um, I think <clears throat> a lot of the principles uh, come from even user-centered uh, user -centered place. A lot of those principles uh, are um, graphic design principles. And those have been refined over years of people, how they use content, et cetera. So, um, when uh, there's the aesthetic part that's about emotion and feeling and expression and expressing that brand, but it does all need to uh, uh, be usable. And, and we have to truly understand uh, deeply who's using it, who's not. I think the, the, I've seen the audiences over the 20 years I've been doing this get more and more sophisticated as there's more software out there, more different types of experiences, the overall kind of a, you know, ability of, uh, and the understanding of today's market is super high, so I think there's some more flexibility there to do new things, but yet at the end of the day, the principles, I think, are informed uh, by good usage, and then as a interaction designer, we gotta make sure the scenarios are the high priority scenarios and apply accordingly. Um, let's see, I think we're wrapping up. Uh, so thanks very much for listening. It was, it was a pleasure. Thank you.